Thank you for joining the CCIH virtual conference. Our discussion today is on building a hybrid model for improving mental health and preventing suicide in Bangladesh. We're gonna wait a couple more minutes to allow others to join. So please be worth, bear, uh, bear with us. Welcome to those who are slowly joining our session this morning. Welcome. Uh, we're going to wait a few more minutes uh, to allow others to join. Again, we welcome those as you log into the session. Uh, we appreciate you coming and attending. We're gonna wait just a couple more minutes uh, as, as others join our session. Welcome to those who are entering our session. We're gonna wait just another minute or two. Welcome everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the CCIH virtual conference. Our discussion today is on building a hybrid model for improving mental health and preventing suicide in Bangladesh. I'm Dr. Jason Pulser. Uh, welcome. If you're new to CCIH, it's an international network of approximately 115 Christian organizations and 15 secular partners, as well as a few hundred individual members. CCIH's mission is to promote health and wholeness from a Christian perspective and provides opportunities for capacity building, networking, sharing best practices, and advocacy. This week of the conference is sponsored by AmeriCares, AmeriCares saves lives and improves health for people affected by poverty or disaster so they can reach their full potential. We thank AmeriCares for their support. As far as the flow of the webinar today, uh, please feel free to type questions into the chat to the side of the video on YouTube. In order to post a question, you do need to be signed into Google and have a YouTube channel, even if there are no videos on it. If it's a problem for you, you're welcome to email questions to webinar at ccih.org, and we will get them that way. Again, that's webinar at ccih.org. Please feel free to post your questions when you think of them. 
Um, but we will hear the presentations first. There are three presentations today. Uh, we'll hear all of them before opening it up to Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the CCIH YouTube channel in a conference playlist. And you'll find links to the recordings on the CCIH website at www.ccih.org. My name is Dr. Jason Pulzer. I'll be your moderator this morning. I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology at Baylor University. I study substance abuse uh, prevention in lower income populations. My research focuses on adapting behavioral screening and intervention for use in community-based settings. My specific interest is in leveraging faith-based partnerships and especially the local church in developing effective peer recovery programs. I received my MPH from the University of Minnesota and my PhD in population health sciences from the University of Wisconsin. Our first speaker today is Dr. Chris Pranger. Dr. Pranger is a family medicine doctor who trained at The Ohio State University London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Fuller Theological Seminary. After residency, she spent five years as part of the Indian Health Service on the Navajo Reservation in Shiprock, New Mexico. Since 1997, she has worked at a rural Northwest Bangladesh Health and Development Mission. She's worked in hospital obstetrics, setting up community health clinics, and adapting those processes to partner with government health services. She currently, she currently works in resource development and communication. So we welcome Dr. Chris Pranger. Thank you for this opportunity to introduce this set of presentations about holistic care contributing to mental health. Mine describes a public-private partnership approach of sexual and reproductive health service delivery being adapted to include adolescent counseling. Next. In Bangladesh, the mental health situation is rather grim, especially for adolescents. Suicide is usually impulsive with married adolescent girls committing suicide 22 times more often than those not yet married. The rate is four to six times higher for younger compared to older women, and it is the second highest cause of death in 15 to 19 year old girls in Bangladesh. There is a near universal experience of gender based violence, either sexual, physical, or verbal, and there are inadequate services and limited understanding of mental health care. Next. Sexual and reproductive health, on the other hand, has been a relative service strength. The UN recognized Bangladesh's prime minister for substantial gains in reducing maternal mortality by 66% over the Millennium Development Goal period of 1990 to 2015. However, adolescents remain behind, impacted by the highest rate of under 15 marriage in the world. Drivers of early marriage include poverty, dowry practices where the bride's family pays to the grooms, and vulnerability, particularly in areas where floods regularly displace families. An increase in early marriage has already been reported because of the COVID lockdown, with schools closed and lost family income, increasing the vulnerability of the girls. Complications of early pregnancy are the number one cause of death among 15 to 19 year old girls. There is substantial shame and stigma related to menstruation, such as being too impure while menstruating to fast during Ramadan. To address these issues, the government health ministry has worked to develop adolescent friendly health services. Next. LAM applied a public private partnership model supporting local government facility implementation, seeking to develop sustainable adolescent friendly services by training existing government sexual and reproductive health providers as counselors. In theory, they were known to the community and available in the facilities, though hours of work could be sporadic. The approach was to empower adolescents in the clinics, primarily through answering sexual and reproductive health questions. Health information was expected to reduce anxiety. 
Lamb Values counselors were also present in the clinics regularly, bringing Bible teaching tailored to adolescents to increase staff sensitivity to their issues. Next. The public-private partnership adapted Lamb's previously independent community work in maternal, newborn, and child-focused health clinics. Community skilled birth attendants had been trained to perform safe deliveries and refer to Lamb Hospital. The clinics function with community committee oversight and fundraising responsibilities to support the community skilled birth attendants. Adolescents, parents, and community groups targeted social determinants of health, such as reducing early marriage, and at meetings would discuss Bible verses linked to life skills designed to increase girls' capacity to influence her own choices and how God's gift of family and health includes his presence through difficulties. Next. The development of counseling corners involved training 56 facility-based and 50 community healthcare providers using a government curriculum for adolescent friendly health services, which included counseling skills. LAM staff provided accountability with presence in the clinic environment as well as supporting the linkages with gatekeepers, including religious leaders, teachers, and local council members. The trainers were government doctors, considered most appropriate for the task because of their authority as key technical persons able to provide adequate information regarding puberty and sexual and reproductive health. Rooms were designated in the facilities with comfortable furniture and books providing even more information. Next. The counseling corners in lamb working areas were widely used, consistent with nationwide statistics. Over a three-year project period, the 125,000 11 to 19-year-olds visited these corners. 78% were female and 22% were male, with questions related most commonly to body image among the boys and menstruation among the girls. There was three and a half times greater use among married adolescents than unmarried, According to a community scorecard, the counseling corners met a felt need with those located closer to schools used more, though two times more married girls were satisfied with the privacy compared, compared to unmarried girls. One girl told of her experience with a health provider. She was married at 14 and her first baby died during delivery. She came to speak to the counselor who suggested early marriage as, as the root cause of maternal and neonatal death. As a result, the girl pledged to advocate against early marriage. So her story was considered a success at the time. In a 2019 UNFPA nationwide evaluation of the approach, it found stigma potentially influencing use. Facilities were perceived to prioritize maternity care and family planning. So there was a risk that unmarried girls would be thought bad if seen going. Next. There was a clear impact among community leaders. For example, teachers trained as referral agents who felt their new role reduced the distance between teacher and student. Educators needed and wanted to know more about how to teach well, along with wanting to expand their role in adolescent health. One teacher at a madrasa in the picture, a Muslim religious school, refused to allow girls initially to play in a soccer tournament organized by the project. The girls protested and so were eventually given permission. Afterward, the teacher said, I had no idea girls were strong enough to play a whole game of football. So from the government perspective, this project was seen to improve adolescent sexual and reproductive health thanks to medical participation in the counseling visits, but a strong contribution came actually from community change. Next, barriers and challenges to this approach of sexual next, uh, sexual and reproductive health providers as counselors include how the facilities remain under-resourced, such as in a 2017 facility assessment that was just published recently in February, it was found that only 4% of government facilities intended to provide pregnancy care were able to do simple blood sugar or hemoglobin or urine pregnancy protein or glucose testing. So because Bangladesh families are aware of weaknesses in the government health system, they have increasingly chosen private clinics where the C-section rate is 93%. So at antenatal visits, LAM providers explain this assessment tool so families can at least ask about availability of care components such as neonatal resuscitation and blood transfusions as the drawing shows. 
Essential mental health services exist on paper, but are weak in reality. Community facilities are intended to support rehabilitation of mental health patients and fight stigma, but training tends to be information-based and focus on medical issues such as family planning, reproductive tract infections, or HIV AIDS. What is called adolescent health counseling is information on puberty, safe sexual behavior, prevention of early marriage, substance abuse, as well as mental health. With hierarchical expectations, authoritative experts see their task as telling young people what to do. Next. Sexual and reproductive health providers have the opportunity to impact both maternal and mental health related mortality. But the potential for stigma in the clinic setting means they may not be safe spaces. Also being told what to do may not help empower young women such as in the story I told earlier of how one young girl's counselor said early marriage was the root cause of her problem and it shouldn't have happened, which doesn't really help her change her situation. So you'll hear shortly from my colleague Nancy about work to empower adolescents. There are also cultural constraints of providers who expect to dispense directives but who don't address the fear and anxiety of the young girl in the story, who feels the need to prove her worth by having a healthy baby. To illustrate this, at a recent counseling training in Bangladesh, the English speaking trainers repeated many times, counselors should not give advice. But in the Bengali language, counselor is data, literally advice giver. So translators kept saying, Advice givers, don't give advice. This is a really hard cultural expectation to break. Finally, when working in health facilities, there is such a power dynamic in medicine at play. So perhaps for planners of public-private partnerships in medical facilities or in mental health care, we need to consider how we offer knowledge and care, but perhaps with the humility of an upside down kingdom perspective, which you'll hear about next a bit more from my colleague, Deb from LAMP. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, that was fantastic. Really appreciate your experience and perspective um, in LAMP and the work with adolescent sexual reproductive health and mental health and how uh, the two are related, connected, and the um, opportunities that exist within the healthcare system and that public-private model. Uh, I think it's really, really great. Thank you for sharing. Our next, present, our next presenter is Dr. Deborah Schaup. Uh, she's Deputy Hospital Director for Administration at the Lamb Hospital in Bangladesh. She's a pediatric nurse practitioner. Dr. Schaut earned her Doctor of Ministry degree from Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan and earned an MPH from the University of North Carolina. Welcome, Deb. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present. At LAM Integrated Rural Health and Development, we began a strategic initiative for improved mental health. My part of this presentation is to propose that such an initiative needs to be purpose-built, building on values for sustainability. In mental health program, in our experience, if it is a government program, it will be accepted as authoritative, but will be one approach to fit all. If it is donor funded, once the funds end, the sustainability is in question as workers must move on to their next source of income. If it is part of the values of the community, they will sustain and promote it. Next. WHO estimates that neuropsychiatric disorders in Bangladesh contribute to 11.2% of the total disease burden. Bangladesh conducted a nationwide survey to inform the national mental health strategy in 2018 to 19. In a self-reporting questionnaire, 17% of people reported having a mental health disorder. 7% were depressive disorders and four to 5% anxiety disorders. At LAM, our aim is to open edition mental emotional health 
pathways to care at the primary community level in the target communities. Our primary target includes those with mood disorders, depression, and anxiety. Those with more severe illness, such as psychosis, may be identified and referred. We hope to do so through primary care providers, including aunties on the bench, who I will say more about later, adolescent facilitators, trained peers, and healthcare providers at LAM. Next. Within Bangladesh, there are basically two cadre of mental health practitioners that are available to most people. At community level are traditional healers, like those we call Koviraj, practitioners who deal with human physiological balance of humors, wind, bile, mucus. If they're in balance, there is no disease. Disharmony in body and mind cause illness. We need a proper balance. Holy words and ambulance also help in spiritual illness. Other similar shamanistic healers also exist. A second cadre of workers are doctors, general medicine doctors and psychiatrists. Other trained listeners are generally absent and medical doctors often have minimal training in mental health care. Next. Why these people as mental health practitioners? In communal societies like ours, the identity of a person is defined by those around them. So the central me, whoever that might be, can only understand themselves in light of relationships with others. Closest are usually immediate and extended family. We have built in a, our baseline study interviews with persons with mental illness and their families. But sadly, we were unable to complete this due to date due to lockdown. Our, from design stage, we have made a commitment to co-production so that what we do is informed and shaped by persons with lived experience. Persons with mental health and their families need to be asked to shape us and our thinking. Others who closely shape the me include their worship community and neighbors. In the initial community where we are implementing mental health work, we are borrowing from the friends on the bench model that some of you have championed. We call them aunties and they are older respected volunteers chosen from the church and community who will be trained as listeners. In the neighborhoods throughout through adolescent facilitators, we are beginning to train up peer educators who can reach thousands of teenagers. We have also assessed our own healthcare workers at LAM, and it is anticipated they will receive referrals from the community as those who need further care. Next, in the 2015 article from the Journal of Health and Social Behavior, data became available to address the question, do larger co cultural contexts of stigma differ significantly? Preliminary findings suggest they do and are very high in Bangladesh. Next. We assessed our own healthcare workers for their stigma against persons with depression and anxiety as measured by their desire for social distance, their perception of, their, of the person as being dangerous or as being unable to make their own decisions. But we found two additional interesting issues. Overall, healthcare workers who do not know anyone with mental illness express lower stigma than those who do know someone. And those with a mental illness themselves expressed higher stigma than those without mental illness, but the numbers were very low. Is it possible that those with mental illness have so internalized the stigma they feel that they too believe themselves to be socially undesirable dangerous or incapable of good decision-making. Next. This slide attempts to summarize some of the issues which we have encountered as a result of choosing to start from the baseline with assessing mental health needs. We have professionals who admit mental health is content they don't know, but we want to practice skills and understanding 
not just have a content to teach. Chris already mentioned the issue of the Poramosho Data as an advice giver. Our need is for more listeners. Our health professionals have lots of work experience with sexual reproductive health, but lacking in mental health. The intersect between the two can be informed by, the by our assessment. In the community, those who see mental illness express stigma, including fear, yet they are the closest source for care. If we can help people to recognize, perhaps we can reduce straight stigma. The attitudes sometimes come out in local language where mental health problems are referred to as mad, brain short, or half mental. Stories from those with mental health issues and their family members model something different. And together, if both non-professionals identify um, needs, our default thinking is that they need a professional backup system. If we build in skills, then healthcare workers complement lay health workers. Each can learn from the other. Professionals can bring evidence-based practice and perceived needs allow for co-production. Next. An additional challenge we faced is that mental health and sexual reproductive health are both sensitive issues in our culture. In an effort to assess them and the intersect, we decided to use the pediatric symptom checklist for youth for mental health and an anonymous voting activity for sexual reproductive health. The same respondents completed both assessments. Our hypothesis was that those who scored high on the YPSC, meaning those with difficulties in psychosocial functioning, would also report adverse, adverse events related to sexual reproductive health. We found the numbers of those scoring high on YPSC screening were too low for statistical purposes to separate them out for the anonymous surveys. From the YPSC, 7 to 11% of respondents scored high, and among them, 70% internalized their feelings. Could this be a contributor toward our high rates of suicide? The sexual reproductive health screen found notable levels of violence. In a South African study, poly victimization, which was defined as exposure to violence across multiple contexts, is associated with poor mental health outcomes in girls and poor house health status in boys and girls. And seven to 19% of the adolescents screened also reported adverse events in their sexual reproductive health histories. Next. How can we improve on other information oriented sexual reproductive health education? We have corresponded with and borrowed heavily from the work of others in South Asia, such as Nadish in India and Girls First from Corestone in Afghanistan. We're grateful for their generously sharing their learnings. In a country that has exceptional rote learning skills, people are able to learn and repeat what they remember. But the use of the information is important for any of us to move on to understand and the ability to apply information learned. Bloom's taxonomy will be familiar to those of you who are educators who work to design lessons that move people to higher order thinking skills. Our lessons also emphasize a balance of reduction of risk factors with increase in protective factors. Next. As we work, we wanted to be grounded in and promote biblical values. We can learn from those with personal mental health experience new ways to read and understand scripture. Here is an example from Psalm 139. What does it mean to invite Jesus to search me and know my anxiety? I am learning from my own family member to read it as suggested here. Search me, you know that I'm wired for anxiety this is a given in my life. Understand my heart. I want to follow you even when the anxiety 
threatens my ability to cope. See if there is any wicked in, way in me. My anxiety is an explanation, but not an excuse for refusing to follow. Lead me in the way everlasting, your way. I long to follow in it. Next. As we aim to fill a gap in mental health care provision, we want to make it sustainable. Building from the ground up allows a connection with community, dialogue about local and biblical values, and it's not subject to government whims nor donor demands. Among the biblical values is that of embracing others, including those with mental illness, rather than excluding them. An online review of the book, Exclusion and Embrace, brings a fitting quote. Miroslav Wolf proposes the idea of embrace as a theological response to the problem of exclusion, pertinent to those stigmatized. Christians must learn that salvation comes not only as we are reconciled to God and not only as we learn to live with one another, but as we take the dangerous and costly step of opening ourselves to the other, of enfolding him or her in the insane embrace with which we have been enfolded by God, making mental health care an exchange between professionals and community will help us to embrace one another toward lasting change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schott. That was great. I really appreciate your perspective on that uh, integration of the healthcare and lay health community workers, that paraprofessional model, and, and rephrasing, reframing um, biblical values with community values and how they can be aligned and built on each other to really help understand uh, the internalization of anxiety and depression and how that manifests itself uh, in mental health. Um, thank you for, for sharing. Our last speaker uh, today uh, for this session is Nancy Tembrook. Uh, Nancy is a senior program consultant and health advisor with World Renew. She has served with World Renew in Bangladesh and in India since 1987. She currently works as a World Renew field staff member consulting with local partners in Bangladesh and India in health and integrated community development programming. In addition, Nancy provides support to World Renew staff in eight countries working on a foundation grant in maternal and child health and nutrition. Nancy's overall focus is primarily rural community development and helping partners carry out programs in local communities. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you for the opportunity today. It's an honor to be sharing about the work of World Renew alongside my colleagues from Lamb Hospital. World Renew and our partners have collaborated with LAM on many activities, especially around training, management information systems, and more recently, trauma healing. I am going to share about our continuing journey in working with adolescents and expanding to a more holistic approach, including mental health. World Renew is an organization that works on capacity building of local partners, so we don't directly implement but we work alongside local partners already based within the country. Next. This is the vision and mission of World Renew. And I just want to highlight the importance we have of renewing hope, reconciling lives and restoring creation. We have worked with integrated programming for decades, but primarily with men, women and children. Next. For those of you that attended a previous webinar that I was on, I shared about the model that we use in World Renew. It is a community-based ground up approach, helping to build community leadership and thus sustainability. It starts with primary groups, often beginning with village savings and loan programs and separate because of cultural context for men and women. Each village has at least one men's and one women's group based on their interest. These groups could be anywhere from 15 to 30 members, depending on location and context. The second level is the next level up in the geographic region. So moving from the village to the union level made up of 10 to 15 villages. From this, representatives come from each of the groups. 
Their responsibility is to learn to oversee the primary group activities, which could be agriculture, literacy, savings and loans, income generation, health, or peace and justice. And then the highest tier is the people's institution. And this is the governance level. And this is made up of all the groups in five to seven unions and representatives then come from the, the CCC or the mid-level. This is mixed men and women and they work to become registered legally with the government. So they try to provide some services but really try to do extensive networking and link with what's already there. They have volunteers and oversee the volunteer community health volunteers, model farmers and so forth. And this is really the sustainability portion of key concepts and activities. And we root this in the value of caring for your neighbors. Next. Again, this slide just highlights again the community leadership structure. It's a continuum of three levels and works to develop capacity and leadership at the community level. Um, this leadership will change every couple of years and everybody has different responsibilities based on their gifts and interests. So one of the key roles of the People's Institution or PI as I abbreviate is uh, networking and how to support the community by linking them with government and non-government institutions. Um, they work to identify linkages and build relationships. So it's not a parallel system, but they work on advocating for services. Next. Up until about 10 years ago, most of our work was with adult men, women, and children. But in working in urban slums, we started to hear concerns of parents in primary groups and people's institutions who felt inadequate to address the needs of their adolescent children, recognizing their vulnerability in the midst of physical and emotional changes. So again, under the same structure of the people's institution, adolescent groups were formed as support groups for them, starting in education and peace and justice. At, at the primary group level, these are groups exclusively for adolescents. Then they adjoin with the adult union committee and people's institutions representing the adolescent voice of their community. Again, this is building from the ground up and local partners and community are learning together. Next. Over the past few years, we have recognized the unique needs of adolescents. There was an intense need for support based on issues and stress that the youth were facing. As we and our local partners begin to work with them, they worked on identifying needs and then potential resources, as you can see here in this uh, busy slide. The foundation was in developing peer educators. These are youth that had a desire and aptitude to lead other youth. The example on the right is a diagram based on health programming where peer educators work with the youth, link with other services and provide connections to parent groups. These peer educators are volunteers from their own community and they receive extensive training on facilitation and are trained to provide some basic counseling, mainly listening and help to link the youth who are in crisis or need support. Next. In all programming that we do with partners, including the training, we ensure that these are biblical values based. This is similar to what Dr. Deb and Dr. Chris mentioned in their previous slides. We have found that adolescents and adults are okay with listening to stories from our teacher. We have found lessons relate directly to them. For example, you are made in the image of God can promote good discussions on self-worth. There are opportunities to go deeper as questions are asked. These lessons are in the form of stories with questions for the group to respond to. We often also collaborate with Lamb Hospital for training of partner organization staff and volunteers and appreciate their values-based approach as well, which is compatible and similar to ours. Next. As the adolescents meet, we find that issues come up and sometimes these issues need to be addressed more broadly at the community level. So we find that there are three areas here working on leadership building to address broader systemic issues um, like early marriage, for example. So awareness, education, motivation, advocacy, and networking, finding the right resources based on the need. Next.
Okay, next again. This is an example of that, okay. I am just sharing a few results based on some of the issues we have uncovered in work in community groups. These results are just from one area of around 1,000 adolescents in an anonymous survey method. We can see that Eve teasing and sexual harassment is a huge issue. Next. As trained staff work with the peer educators and communities, they together identify resources that can be helpful for individuals having specific needs and mental health issues or for the whole community. This is an ongoing list with things continually being added. Next. Trauma healing is something we as World Renew Bangladesh have become deeply involved with over the last few years, seeing it as something very beneficial and addressing a real need. We have been doing this with local churches and have a large number of facilitators and healing group leaders trained, as well as a master trainer. Lamb Hospital staff have also been trained by us in trauma healing. There are now modules that are more generic for audiences of different faiths, and we have translated these and are beginning to identify facilitators and start the training process for this. We have found in our early work with adolescents that trauma is very present and trauma healing a great need. So we are giving high priority to this currently. We see this work in mental health and with adolescents is in its beginning stages and something being developed from the ground up. Because of the group structure, we are seeing sustainability developing. We also hope to explore training more like the aunties on the bench as people in the community who can also be listeners. And we are getting a lot of input and support from Lamb Hospital in learning more about this. Next. So we hope to continue learning from Lamb communities and others on developing programs to address the needs of mental health. Because we work in integrated transformational community development, we see this not only as a cross cutting theme, but something that we need to address. This is an ongoing process to work and to meet a very real and present need. We appreciate all of the data that World Renew and LAM are collecting that helps to inform us and to our work. And we praise God for these opportunities to work with adolescents and help them as they grow. We thank you for your support and your listening today. And please feel free to ask any of us questions or to give input to us. Thank you very much. Nancy, thank you. Um, again, great information and appreciate your time. Appreciate the time of, of each of you uh, for sharing your experience. Nancy, I really love how you know you you clearly articulated the model that three tiered model uh, from with primary groups, central call committees, and people's uh, institute, and how that structuring is really um, um, supporting of each other and, and important um, to link uh, the various levels to the resources needed uh, to support those community groups and enforce this idea of identity um, and and made in the image of God um, as really critical and central to, to building a healthy individual and community mental health um, framework. So thank you for sharing that. We, we do have a, a few questions coming in and I re, I'll remind uh, the attendees and participants of the session that if you do have a question, um, please put your question in the box to the right of the video in YouTube or send them by email to webinar at ccih.org. So you can um, put them in either of two places, either in the chat area on the right of the YouTube video or in an email to webinar at ccih.org. Uh, the first question uh, we have coming in uh, can be addressed to Deb and, and or Nancy. You both brought up the, the model of the aunties on the bench or friendship benches. And um, Phil Moses from Food for the Hungry asked, can you please give more details on the aunties on the bench model? Okay, I can start us off with that. The model we actually learned from Nadisha um, in India in Core Stone in Afghanistan. And they have the community or the church themselves identify respected older women who people would naturally go to for advice. 
and they train them to be listeners and to respond to needs and um, where to refer on if there's evidence that this needs to be done. So um, yeah, we're hoping that as a follow-up to another program we ran called Church and Community Transformation, we can identify those women, train them, and they make themselves available in the community, hence the bench. There's just a place in the community where people come, can come, and the um, helper is available there. But the helper has advanced skills in listening and identifying needs, helping the person to think about next steps and um, when need for referral becomes evident. Yeah, just to add that um, this is a process we are learning about, but we had seen it naturally taking place in the communities already, where there seemed to be specific people, uh, older people, that youth went to, you know, and we often found them in part of a community where they would go and share so now learning about this more formal, um, this aunties on a bench and how to train them better to listen is something that we're really starting to explore now in addition to the peer educators. Um, so it seems like something that will have promise. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and we recently came across this model too um, from some work in Zimbabwe by Dr. Chibanda. Uh, and there's some studies published on it from, from Zimbabwe if you're interested in looking at those. Um, but in this era of COVID and the social distancing, this friendship on the on the bench model can be really effective. And we're actually thinking about possibly doing something similar here in Waco, uh, putting some friendship benches here. So it's one of those models that I think has a lot of utility, uh, regardless of, of the location um, and, and, and leveraging the wisdom of the uh, aunties and grandmothers, grandfathers in the community to really support mental health, which I think is, is essential. Uh, the next question is for Deb and Chris. Uh, is your, your no, no, we're not just talking about uh, the aunties on the bench model, but the larger model. Is the model being implemented based upon a previously trialed model elsewhere? Uh, and could it be expanded to other areas of Bangladesh? And this question is from Vicki Ibbett. Hi, Vicki. I will answer that uh, briefly anyway. I know the, the specific adolescent friendly health services was a is a government program so it is actually being expanded throughout bangladesh the perhaps biggest question is how effectively um <coughs> i hope that the the public private partnership model of the accountability involved in actually making sure there are counselors physically available um if that's the model you mean i think there are other ngos that are are working on that in a plan international uh, for sure we've worked with them there and they've been involved as far as how it's been implemented outside of Bangladesh I'm not sure the next question is actually related to that um, for Chris and Deb and do you plan to evaluate your program and again this question is from Phil Moses um, yeah, do you plan to evaluate it? How will you measure the impact of the interventions? Okay, I can start us out on that one. Our management information systems and research department is doing a baseline assessment um, before we start the intervention so that we will have comparisons for that. Part of it, of course, will just be knowledge of even the availability of the services, um, who these trained listeners are, if people recognize that they're there and can be um, approached. And um, from the side of the trained listeners, they'll keep track of who came and where they referred. Uh, we anticipate that people will come for issues other than what traditionally we would think of as mental health issues, things like infertility or perhaps other pertinent issues to them. And um, we also wanna talk to the adolescents, of course, have their reporting on availability of help when they need it and the effectiveness of the listeners that they approached. So uh, yeah, we have indicators laid, laid out in the baseline survey and those could be shared out. Thanks, Deb. Our next question is from 
Dr. Douglas Huber. In this predominantly Muslim country, have you used uh, Islamic teachings that support improved sexual reproductive health and mental health? In our experience, when we share biblical values, um, largely our audiences are Muslim. And it just allows for really good discussions between the values of the Islamic faith and the values of our faith. And we have a very folk Islam where we work. The values often um, resonate with everyone mm -hmm. and we can have discussions from there. Right, just to echo, our, our experience has been the same and you know, discussions happen, it's, it's um, uh, they often, yeah, cite things and, and the, the things are the values are very similar or can be. And so good discussions happen. Mm -hmm. And then connected with that, uh, I know in, in, I think it was, that was your presentation talking about working with the teachers and many of them um, Muslim teachers. What about partnering with mullahs or imams? Uh, in the same messaging of your work. Also, this question is from uh, Dr. Dr. Douglas Huber. Yeah, that I was going. That is exactly what I was going to add. That that's very common here. Uh, Imams, opinion leaders, so they definitely are involved and are trained. Um, if there is resistance, it doesn't usually come out in the sessions we have. That there have been issues in the past about other. Um, other times, but not not as much recently. Um, and so I think in general, yeah, it's a very common thing in any sort of meeting here that you will always start with a recitation from the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita and the Bible. That's just very standard. Um, and then actually, as, as my colleagues have said, the, the, a lot of the values can actually, the values that are talked about in those kinds of sessions are very similar. We definitely don't particularly explicitly challenge um, them. And I guess I am challenged by the idea of finding Islamic teachings that do support the specifics of what would be in sexual and reproductive health and mental health. I think that's a very valid question, but again, as Deb said, they, they do tend to come out with the most positive uh, values that are not that different. So it's a good bridge. Right. And just to say in our programming, um, particularly in some recent health program we did, involving the mullahs and including them in the, the events, the training, but also the community events for opinions and so forth. So um, that's been very important, an important feature of the work of our partners. Thanks. The next question is also uh, again from Phil and he asks, could you please define e-teasing? And this question is for Nancy. Right, that seems to be a term that really comes out of Bangladesh, that e-teasing. <laughs> it's basically teasing of girls and girls find that happens all the time. They're walking down a road and people will comment on, the boys will comment on the way they look or um, so forth, um, kind of calling things out. And it's, it's a reason why girls don't like to go out and they talk about this a lot. So walking in groups or with their parents and you know, when you start discussing this in groups and with, with boys about you know, the, the concern of this, it's kind of an awareness. It's something that's always been done, you know, Eve teasing, teasing of girls. But it is a, 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 if you read in the literature, it's something that a term that I think has come out of, of Bangladesh. But its source basically is that Eve yeah. tempted Adam. Right. Right. Therefore, uh, girls are temptresses, uh, those sorts of, that's where the Eve mm -hmm. teasing comes right. from. So the way they, they dress, the way they talk, everything they do, the responsibility is on the girl, not the boy to, to control anything. So the responsibility mm -hmm. is on the girl, so she must dress in a certain way, talk in a certain way, so that she's not tempting or teasing. And I would add as well that in our early studies on suicide, um, the definition of ease teething was very broad. Eve, mm -hmm. It went all the way from just mm -hmm. like sexual comments to rape. Right. right. Just following up on that, what are, what are your thoughts and what, you know, to what level do you agree 
that it's the responsibility of the girl versus, um, or is that what people think culturally? <laughs> ah! <laughs> for all of us, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes what we think doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It's the cultural context that we deal in, yes? And um, yeah, so to help um, the boys realize that um, they're, they have responsibility in these things, to help the girls realize. I mean, the feeling is so strong that girls feel like sometimes they can only bring shame on their family where boys can bring honor to their family. And those are really deep seated feelings that run across gender lines, yeah? So it's a huge question of how to deal with all that. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge part of the vulnerability that parents, parents feel the responsibility to protect their girls. And that's why, like I said, with the, with the COVID lockdown, um, girls at home are then vulnerable to other relatives mm -hmm. who are also at home, um, as well as just the, uh, yeah, the risk of um, they're just not sort of located in a school, therefore they could be doing, uh, getting into trouble. So it's, a, it's not just the girls, but the way the parents respond mm -hmm. to that desire to protect them from that. And the best way to protect them is to, to get them married. Right. So the whole thing about about meeting with adults as well, you know, what are the roots of these things and how can it be talked about? And it's very powerful to see girls starting to talk about this and then addressing this with their parents and also boys, you know. Um, so that's been really powerful and important and something that needs to be out there and addressed and talked about and listened to. Thank you. Interesting, interesting conversation. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, the next one is from Vicki. Uh, what, what have been your experience of seeking to link your programs with existing, though limited, special, uh, specialist uh, mental health services? Deb, do you want to take that one a little bit? Deb might be frozen. I just know um, there have been there is extremely limited specialist mental health services in our locality. Um, and so we have, that's, a, Deb just slightly alluded to the idea of having referral pathways uh, developed, uh, but that's still in, in very early stages. So the, the people who are, have been trained in mental health in Bangladesh are very, very aware of the limitations. And so they're very keen to, uh, to, expand, to expand connections, uh, but it's still quite limited. And that's one of the reasons to deal with it at a, a community level approach mm -hmm. because, and again, primarily at the depression anxiety level and not the more significant psychiatric diagnosis, diagnoses. And, and I could add to that, Vicki, it's, it's hard to find out what these are. And I had that busy slide that just showed helping the community identify what are possible services, but then where they're not there to be able to advocate for them mm -hmm. um, with the government and, and other non-government services, that's really important. So we're still in the stage of identifying and helping the community identify because it's been a very closed topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in general, you have found that the specialists have been open and receptive oh, yeah. to linking and partnering and, yeah. and expanding. Where the they service. exist, they're yeah. just yeah. rare. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Paul Shelterfast from the Mennonite Central Committee. Uh, and he says, great presentation, um, really uh, working in the communities that are majority non-Christian. In your experience, does having an explicitly Christian approach, as you've described, help or harm community acceptance? Go ahead, Chris, if you want to start. Add in. Um, I really do believe that it, it helps community acceptance. I think it is just, it's kind of a tricky line to walk. So there's, there's sort of always, it's not just a Christian approach, but just being representing a Christian organization, a Christian mission, the assumption is always made that you're trying to uh, the Bangla term for it is cook up Christians, um, meaning convert people. So that's always the baseline assumption. 
Um, and so there, there is occasional resistance because of that. But in general, uh, there's also the phenomena in this country that, that people name their schools the Holy Family School. They, or, or things like that because that Christian names carry a connotation of good quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just kind of an interesting, like I said, interesting phenomena. But I would say in general, um, it depends on what you call explicitly Christian. So I think Bible verses, Bible teaching, Bible discussions are pretty acceptable in the generic sense of talking about... Um, values and things like that raising raising jesus name and how he cares about um families how 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 he spoke to young people regularly all those sorts of things um generally very acceptable i would agree and paul um i think it's similar in some ways to um some of the peace and justice work that you are doing as well and how you do that um, and we use those modules and methods as well in Bangladesh. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, Nancy, and Deb. We really appreciate the time with you and, and you spending the time to share experience and knowledge. That's been great. Uh, I do want to highlight the fact that there are some mental health resources on the CCIH website under the resources tab. Um, so for those that are interested in learning more, feel free to go there and, and explore those resources. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, there are more sessions on mental health, funding environments, health systems, uh, strengthening community-based programs and advocacy. So if you haven't registered, visit ccih.org. Again, that's www.ccih.org to see the full schedule and then access the registration link uh, to get access to all of those uh, other sessions. Uh, let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time today to learn and grow as your church. We pray for the work of our speakers today and for those listening. May all the sessions during this virtual conference bring encouragement and insight into how your church can best serve the people around them physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Nothing is impossible for you and with all things. And with you, all things are possible. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We wish you uh, a very blessed day today, and thank you for joining us.